Excellent. Well, I had checked uh, for Facebook to send us live when it hits 7 p.m. So I'm currently live on YouTube and Facebook is just waiting for us to go. <laughs> uh huh. Shoot. I had it down to a science and I went and messed it up. <laughs> That's all right. Okay, well, for those who are tuning in already on YouTube, hi, welcome to the Audubon program, the Wichita Audubon Society program for this evening. I'm very sorry that I look confused right now. It's because I'm not certain that we're good. Okay, we are good. Okay, well, uh, my name is Rachel, I'm your Wichita Audubon Vice President, and I'm very excited about the uh, guest speaker we have this evening, Dr. Robert Penner. But before we get to the best part of tonight's presentation, which is of course the presentation itself, I do have some Audubon announcements for everybody. Uh, so first, uh, the nominating committee for the board has uh, presented the following slate of officers for next year. Uh, the president is Dan Householder. The vice president is Kevin Groenewegg. Uh, secretary, Barbara Gobert. Treasurer, Patty Marlett. And on the board of directors, Nick Stroot and Bob Gress. And since no additional nominations have been received, uh, the slate is elected by unanimous consent. So uh, welcome our new slate of directors, board of directors, for the next year. Uh, additionally, we have our Audubon picnic scheduled for July 20th coming up. Uh, there hasn't been been a decision about how we're going to handle that yet but I just want you guys to be aware that it is on our calendar and you should keep an eye out for social media and the newsletter for announcements about it to decide how we're going to have it or whether we can have it uh, so more on that in the future and that's actually all I have for our Audubon announcements so at this point I'm going to turn it over to uh, our guest for this evening. I'll go ahead and introduce him. Um, I say with confidence, even though I definitely, oops, did not have that pulled up. Um, so Dr. Robert Penner is the Avian Conservation Manager at the Nature Conservancy in Kansas, and he's going to be talking about uh, the importance of the mid-continent, Kansas, and specifically the Flint Hills to shorebird conservation. And he has a hand in all of those logos on the screen down there. So I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, excited to hear about your work. You should be good to go, um, even though you're seeing your screen on your end. Yeah. And you might think about places. Global biodiversity crisis. The world being influenced by humans, so much so that human activity is having a significant impact on the planet's climate and ecosystem. And those changes are being seen in bird populations. Last year, a study was published in Science showing 
some of the dramatic declines in bird populations in North America since 1970. They estimate that there are 2.9 billion fewer breeding birds today than there were in the 1970s. And shorebirds are not immune to these declines. Among native species in North America, shorebirds as a group have undergone some of the most significant population changes since 1970 and have the highest proportion of species in decline. An assessment of shorebirds in Canada found that while shorebird species as a group have declined by 40% since 1970, shorebirds that migrate long distances have declined more steeply by 52% compared to short distance migrants that have declined by 23% over the same time period. But who are the shorebirds? Shorebirds are part of a large order of birds which are generally characterized by longish legs and bills, but this group is very diverse. There are five families that breed in North America. The sandpipers are the most diverse family, which includes the smallest shorebird, the least sandpiper, and the largest shorebird in North America, the long-billed curlew. Now the stilts and avocets are those tall and graceful and somewhat showy shorebirds. The plovers are much shorter in statue and are characterized by large eyes that they use to visually hunt for prey items in the mud or in grasslands. The oyster catchers are unmistakable family with the large straight red-orange bills that they use to pry open bivalves such as clams and oysters and their thick pink legs. Perhaps my favorite are the turnstones, which have relatively short legs and a powerful wedge-shaped bill that they use to turn stones and even pry things open. Most people expect that shorebirds can only be found at the beach, like these sanderlings on the coast of Washington. But that's not true. While many shorebirds are commonly found walking around or even wading in the shallow waters on the coast, shorebird use inland wetland sites too, again, like Quivira and Cheyenne Bottoms and other sites here in Kansas. And there is a small group of shorebirds that rely on wide open grassland habitats for the majority of their life cycle. Most shorebirds are migratory and their annual life cycle can be separated into three distinct periods, breeding, migrating, and non-breeding. For shorebirds in North America, the annual cycle can look a lot like this. Breeding during the warm summer months at northern latitudes, a southbound migration during autumn months, followed by a more stationary non-breeding period, which may be as far south as the southern tip of South America and northbound migration back to the breeding grounds. 71% of all shorebirds in North America nest in boreal or arctic regions. And there are some characteristics about shorebirds that makes their conservation challenging. Many shorebird species are among the most migratory animals on earth and protecting them will take an effort across an extremely large geography. For example, protecting the important habitat for a single species may mean working with people from many countries, but shorebirds also provide a unique opportunity for diplomacy and a chance to bring the people of the Americas together. Another challenge is that species tend to group together in big numbers at just a few places in the hemisphere, which makes them susceptible to changes occurring at these sites. And shorebirds only lay a few eggs in a nest. That, coupled with the fact that one third of North American shorebird species have fewer than 25,000 birds, places increased pressure on ensuring the survival of remaining shorebirds. In the Americas, shorebirds move between breeding and non breeding areas along broadly defined flyways that link the northern breeding areas with more southerly non-breeding areas. Although some species don't migrate north and south along the exact same pathway. 
In the Americas, these flyways are the Pacific, the Mid-Continent, and the Atlantic. To help conserve species in America, flyway-wide conservation strategies have been developed in both the Atlantic and the Pacific flyways. This is where conservation partners across many countries have worked together to outline conservation strategies that address the specific needs of a particular flyway. The Mid-Continent Shorebird Conservation Initiative is currently under development and the first draft will be rolled out later this year. Kansas is in the Mid-Continent Americas Flyway, which is uh, roughly bordered on the west by the Rocky Mountains and on the east by the Appalachians. Now the Mid-Continent of North America is host to more shorebirds during the pre-breeding period than the other two combined. Now during post-breeding, we can't quite say the same thing because about 2 million shorebirds return south following the Atlantic Americas Flyway. But no matter how you look at it, the mid-continent is extremely important to shorebirds. Most people think that shorebirds are just passing through the region. But the fact is that 41% of the 45 species in the region actually nest here. For the Flint Hills, species like the killdeer or the upland sandpiper are common nesters of the grasslands. Also, while many species that use the mid-continent of North America do migrate long distances to spend their winters in Southern South America and breed in the Arctic, a fair number of shorebirds in this flyway are short distance migrants like the killdeer that may not even leave Kansas in the winter or at least moves just a little farther south. And the shorebirds that use the mid-continent are not immune to the population declines that are being observed in birds. More than half of the mid-continent populations are showing long-term declines. Now there are seven shorebird species that have more than 90% of their entire population passing through the mid-continent. Again, making this region extremely important to their survival. While nearly the entire population of buff-breasted sandpipers passes through the mid-continent region, it is highly likely that the majority of these are passing through Kansas specifically. Whereas about 91% of the upland sandpiper population is migrating through the region, with the majority actually nesting in the region. And the Flint Hills is a stronghold for this species. Even if we take it down to that 70 to 90% level, we still see a large number of shorebirds passing through the mid-continent. And all of these species occur in significant numbers here in Kansas, either at places like Cheyenne Bottoms and Quivira, or in the case of the American Golden Plover, places like the Flint Hills. Even the killdeer is an important shorebird species in the mid-continent with about 50% of its population passing through or staying to nest in the region, with the majority of, of these actually found in the central flyway portion of the mid-continent. While these are impressive numbers, they are but a fraction of what they once were. Indeed, grasslands that, uh, that the shorebirds and many other wildlife species rely on are also but a fraction of what they once were. A vast, prairie ecosystem once dominated the mid-continent. Stretching from southern, Can excuse me, southern Canada to Texas, the tall grass prairie seen here in light green is, has been reduced to just 4% of the original. The Flint Hills, consisting of 6.3 million acres in Kansas and Oklahoma, is the stronghold for this important tall grass prairie habitat. Tribal communities generally regarded their winged neighbors with reverence, unseen in much of today's industrialized world. A key reason for this was due to the familiarity these cultures have with wildlife, an intimacy that fosters a sense of kinship with nature, something that is mostly lost today. The Flint Hills region is dominated by gently rolling hills of grass, 
which has largely been protected from cultivation due to a layer of rock known as flint, as you can see right underneath the surface. As such, this region is well suited for grazing and it still maintains some resemblance of earlier days. Ranching in the Flint Hills has been going on for hundreds of years. Ranching is a very important part of the economy. With 98% of the Flint Hills under private ownership, and most of that in ranches, ranchers are key to conserving the Flint Hills. A common grassland management practice in the Flint Hills is annual burning. Providing fresh, lush grass increases livestock weight gains. This burning creates large expanses of freshly burned or black areas that are highly favored by a group of grassland obligate shorebirds. Such as the American Golden Plover, which surveys demonstrated that in 2018, nearly 30% of its entire population passed through the Flint Hills. This is truly a long distance migrant that travels north through Kansas and the Eastern United States, but the majority followed the East Coast on their return trip to South America. And then there's the buff breasted sandpiper in which over 30% of its population was recorded in the Flint Hills in 2014, which allowed the region to be designated as a Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network landscape of hemispheric importance. In fact, nearly 60% of this species entire population has been recorded passing through the Flint Hills. And it is quite possible that close to the entire population passes through the region making this area extremely important to the species survival. Like the American golden plover and the buff breasted sandpiper, the upland sandpiper is also a long distance migrant. While they will nest in the area, a large number are also passing through during migration. With a population estimate of nesting birds in the Flint Hills around 40,000. And then even the killdeer, a short distance mig migrant passes through the region to breeding grounds to the north. Yet some remain to nest and if they do leave Kansas during the winter, they just don't go very far south. Still a common shorebird that is found in many habitats. During the Flint Hills shorebird surveys from 2011 to 2018, over 12,000 were recur recorded during one spring. But since they are so common, it is actually possible that we under-surveyed these guys in favor of looking for the more exciting and rare buff breasted sandpipers and American golden plovers in those recently burned pastures and overlooking the poor killdeers that were just standing along the roadsides. Now the Flint Hills Shorebird Survey was an eight year project from 2011 to 2018 which resulted in, in five major findings. Migrant American golden plovers and buff crested sandpipers are actually more common in the southern portion of the Flint Hills. They use areas with a high proportion of native grass, occur more often in grassland landscapes that are less developed, primarily use grasslands that have been recently burned over other low statute habitats, and the majority of migration was between April 15th to May 10th. Now, variation in migration stopover use among years was in influenced indirectly by precipitation and subsequent grass growth and directly by the amount of burning. After eight years of surveys, we were able to develop a pretty good idea when the peak of American golden plovers migrating through the region was. And we did that for the buff breasted sandpiper also. Because of the clear importance of the Flint Hills to multiple shorebird species, there was 3.7 million acres within the larger Flint Hills landscape that was designated as a landscape of hemispheric importance to shorebirds in 2016. Now the Western Hemispheric Shorebird Reserve Network is a conservation strategy for shorebirds in the Americas. 
there are 107 sites in 17 countries that are today part of the network, meaning that they are very important to shorebirds because they host large numbers of shorebirds or a significant proportion of a certain population of shorebird species. There are also places where organizations and communities have made commitments to conserve the species that use these sites. The network is currently made up of hundreds of different partners. So what attracts shorebirds to the tall grass prairie? Well, it actually is the short grass. See, in general, shorebirds prefer to feed in areas in which the vegetation is less than half the height of the bird. And the majority of species prefer sites with less than 25% vegetative cover. Freshly burned grasslands provide this short and sparse vegetation and also provides for easy access to freshly roasted invertebrates, which are essential to their diet and their need to replenish their fat reserves for those species that need to continue on their northward migration. But even later in the migration period, those areas that were burned a few weeks earlier still provide the desired habitat needed to feed and rest before moving on. And for those species like the killdeer and upland sandpiper that might stay to nest, this is favored habitat for nesting also. A new management technique that is slowly gaining acceptance in the region is burning to control the invasive Cerecia lespedeza in late summer and early fall. Spraying of this invasive plant has been the main control technique, but late summer or early fall burning has exhibited some success in controlling this plant. The time frame for burning aligns pretty nicely with the fall migration of buff-breasted sandpipers and other shorebirds. GPS tagging results show that the buffies or buff-breasted sandpipers that pass through Kansas come through in August. So fall burning has the potential to increase stopover habitat for this species during the fall. And the short grass habitat could quote, carry over into spring migration. However, increasing fall stopover habitat with fall burning was just a hypothesis. So we decided to test this out. In the fall of uh, 2020, we developed a pilot project to survey burned grasslands in the Flint Hills during August and September. Back in the spring migration surveys, we drove set routes looking and just hoping to find burned areas. But during this pilot study, we had at our disposal a new technology that would tell us where the fires were at. So what would happen, I would, I, I would get the uh, NASA fire alert email. I would look at the site and determine if it was truly unfragmented grasslands as seen in the upper left. And then I would pull up another map layer to see if we actually had good access as seen in the lower right. And then we would send our great volunteers out to these sites to look for shorebirds. Now this is simply a map of the location of the 13 fires we surveyed that fall. So are shorebirds using the burned areas during fall migration? Well, although shorebirds use the fall burned grasslands, there may be differences when compared to spring burned grasslands. It appears that late summer, early fall burns leave dense and standing vegetation post burn that might be a hindrance to shorebird use. Remnant standing vegetation was observed at multiple sites during this pilot study. Past surveys show that the shorter the vegetation makes the site more attractive to these shorebirds. It is also possible that the vegetation height information collected in the surveys was not a significant characterization of the habitat available. A total of 139 individuals of the target species were recorded with volunteers surveying 67 miles in seven counties. Although this doesn't sound that impressive, the results are encouraging enough to at least be thinking about additional fall surveys. 
Now, another pilot study that was conducted in 2020 was testing trail cameras on bison wallows. These wallows are a habitat resource that is not well understood and may be providing significant habitat to wetland and grassland species, including shorebirds. During the fall of 2020, we tested different mounting designs on the cameras, mainly to protect them from bison or even cattle. We had a lot of pictures of just the sky as the bison would knock over our cameras. The study seeks to improve our understanding of the spatial extent of bison wallows and the associated wildlife species that rely on them, which will further improve conservation efforts for shorebirds in the Flint Hills. Plus, it was just darn fun to see what critters come to visit these sites. We deployed more cameras this spring and hope to document what species utilize both active and non-active wallows. We are also working to map bison wallow complexes throughout the entire Flint Hills region. We hope to gain more insight on how shorebirds utilize the Flint Hills by piggybacking onto existing research projects, such as GPS tracking of buff-breasted sandpipers, it is planned that uh, GPS transmitters will be placed on spring migrants down in Columbia and Texas this spring, and again this fall up in Alaska, and again, possibly in Texas. Now it is my hope that we will get some data as the birds pass through Kansas. Now it should be noted that since about 1985, intensive early stocking combined with annual spring burdens has become extremely popular in the Flint Hills. But annual burning or fr even frequent burning leads to a scarcity of residual nesting vegetation for grassland birds. And a loss of heterogeneity with annual burning favoring grasses while slowly eliminating many forbs. So what do you do when you're considering the advantages of annual burning for cattle production versus the negatives for wildlife, except for shorebirds and grassland health? What do we do? Well, we're trying to promote mimic uh, historic natural burning and grazing. One example of this is a technique called patch burn grazing. This along with rotational burning or even burning at different times of the year are techniques that could favor both cattle production and wildlife. But let's look at patch burn grazing. What is it? Well, patch burn grazing is where we can have weeds and short grass and tall grass and birds and cows all in the same pasture. Instead of burning your entire pasture, patch burn grazing only burns one third of the pasture each year. So a little later in the season, we get two different types of habitat, the freshly burned green up and what hasn't been burned. And then the next year we burn another third. And so we're gonna see the habitat look like this a little later in the season as compared to what was burned a year ago. And then we burn the other third. So what happens with burning, cattle look at this freshly burned grass as, I don't know, like Krispy Kreme donuts. It's just the place to be. And so they naturally go to these freshly burned areas. And so you get heavy grazing, which will result in short grass or in even some places, bare grass, which for me, buff-breasted sandpipers and American golden plovers just love. Something that was burned the previous year is gonna be moderate grazing and the grass is gonna be about medium height, which is right in the middle of what greater prairie chickens like. Something that was burned two or three years ago is gonna be tall grass with a litter layer. And so the light grazing results in good habitat for things like hens, low sparrows. Once again, something that was burned 
the current year is on the upper left and something that was burned two or three years ago is on the upper right. Two to three different types of habitats in the same pasture. Management of grasslands using such techniques as patch burn grazing, rotational grazing or burning at different times of the year or rotational burning should benefit grassland birds like the buff-breasted sandpiper and the upland sandpiper, but also the short-eared owl and eastern meadowlark, Henslow sparrows and greater prairie chickens will benefit. And just as important, it also helps to maintain the healthy grassland ecosystem by providing at least two years of partial rest for grassland sensitive forbs. Another benefit by not burning every year you can build up greater fuel loads, which means hotter, more intense fires, which have a better chance to control woody vegetation. Without some method to control woody vegetation, trees and shrubs can take over your grasslands, which results in less acres available for grazing and much less desirable to even useless for shorebird stopover habitat. Efforts to adapt land management practices in ways that benefit grassland shorebirds are not limited to Kansas. We can look at the migration of buff-breasted sandpipers as an example of how connected we are to our South American neighbors. There are important stopover sites for this species in South America. The species moves through Colombia during both North and Southbound migration and through Bolivia and Paraguay during their south migration only. Throughout their migration and non-breeding season, buff-breasted sandpipers are relying on grasslands and prairies. Buff-breasted sandpipers spend their non-breeding season in the prairies or pampas of Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. Much like the prairies in North America, nearly 70% of the grasslands and savannas in South America have been fragmented, converted for human use, or otherwise lost. This region is very biodiverse and home to more than 400 bird species and approximately 100 mammals. In this southern cone, just like in North America, ranching is a significant and important economic driver and a cultural staple. However, overgrazing has led to soil erosion expansion of invasive species, and the loss of native wildlife. Grazing is an important management tool across the Americas for the conservation of natural grasslands and the species that rely on them. The Flint Hills is part of a collective and international effort to protect the habitat that these shorebirds need. Shorebird conservation is an international issue. So with that, I'm hoping there's some questions. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I had to unmute my mic on the stream end of things here. Um, but we do actually have uh, quite a few questions uh, that I've received. And for those of you watching, if you have anything sparked, go ahead and leave it on Facebook or on YouTube. I'm watching the comments and I will pass your questions along to Dr. Penner. Um, so first I have a very... Uh, well, hang on, I'll start with something more relevant to what you just uh, were talking about. So with birds like golden plovers and buff-breasted sandpipers, uh, when they are going on these long-distance migrations, do they show similar habitat preferences while they're in, for example, South America? Like when buffies are stopping over in Colombia, are they showing similar habitat preferences that they do in the Flint Hills? Yeah, buff-breasted sandpipers definitely do. Uh, they are looking for short grass habitat. And in South America, it's not created by burning. It's usually created by grazing more than anything. Or also, there are a lot of times seen along uh, riparian areas, which have flooded and, and actually take, you know, knock down the vegetation. So for the buff red sand pipers, they use basically that short grass habitat throughout their whole life cycle. American golden plovers uh, migrate over a, a larger uh, range from Kansas all the way to the East Coast. 
And so they are using not only burned grasslands or hay grasslands, but also crop ground, a uh, fallow crop ground. They've seen a lot in those areas. So they are a little bit uh, more cosmopolitan in, in their habitat use. Uh, but once down in the South America, uh, you know, it's pretty much grasslands again. Gotcha. Ah, this is so fun. Um, okay, I have a question from Dexter Martis, uh, who was really inspired by the buffalo wallows, <laughs> the bison wallows, and uh, yeah. wondered if, if there was maybe a similar uh, habitat niche created potentially historically through beaver meadows. He wonders, do you think that beaver meadows or ponds historically would have been a good habitat for them? Um, presumably the impact of beavers in the Flint Hills is far less than what it was 150 yeah. years ago. Well, actually, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the one thing that we saw, and of course, this is just a pilot we're just testing out, the bison wallows that are used by shorebirds have to be pretty much active. Birds, they, the, so that means either the wallow itself is mud, you know, with standing water or the vegetation around there is real short. Kind of remember that uh, uh, most shorebirds prefer vegetation height that's less than half the height of the bird. Mm -hmm. Having said that, some of the inactive bison wallows that we've seen in the Flint Hills that were holding water uh, attracted snipe because snipe and uh, yellow legs and pectoral sandpipers are a group of birds that are, you know, will feed in dense vegetation. Now, uh, beaver ponds, it's going to highly be dependent on if there's mud flats around these ponds, you know, that's what most of the shorebirds are going to like, or the vegetation has been grazed down. Uh, but any standing water that has, you know, short vegetation or mud flats are going to be attracted to the majority of shorebirds. But again, we just talked about, uh, uh, in a Beaver pond, I could see things like uh, lesser yellow legs, uh, Wilson snipe, you know, those kind of things will use that that type of habitat. Okay. Ah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like trying to process and look at the next question at the same time. I'm just like enjoying these answers so much in these discussions. Um, I see somebody is typing a follow-up, so that's exciting. One of your volunteers actually from Great Plains Nature Center yeah. has a, a question for you. Uh, um, ooh, where did it go? Oh, he wanted to know, this is Alan Saylor, wanted to know, yeah. uh, does waterfowl management end up having an effect on shorebirds and what is that correlation? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, most, most of the time, uh, managers are, when they're managing for waterfowl are trying to create, you know, deeper, uh, water, uh, for shorebirds, uh, excuse me, for waterfowl. Yeah. So, uh, and the problem is, and, on the surface, a lot of times they they have to uh, move water quickly from one cell to another if they have that ability, and so they're really dewatering uh, some areas fast to fill in other ones. So, uh, so you can actually manage for both. It's, it's, it has to do with uh, being able to create a lot of mud flat, shallow water habitat with little little vegetation grading into some deeper stuff for things like geese and you know those diving ducks and things like that so mm -hmm. uh, uh we've put on uh workshops in many places across the country and, and a lot of people that are uh, managing for waterfowl are seeing how they can cr uh, do management for both species and not negatively affect either one so uh but it takes a little bit of an extra effort Alan. it really does yeah. Um, speaking of, of the effort involved, uh, somebody wanted to know uh, if you can comment at all on uh, rancher buy-in. You'd mentioned ranchers being so critical to the conservation efforts because they own a lot of the land that they're using. Um, so uh, I guess the, the question was, how do you get rancher buy-in for birds in general in this sort of situation? Um, but if you yeah. have any other comments on that, that'd be awesome. Well, the new, uh, the Flint Hill Shorebird Conservation Initiative, which has started up uh, just before COVID-19 started, so it slowed us down on a lot of outreach and in-person 
meetings and stuff like that. But the key to this, and what I tried to relate to in, in, in our talk is that we, you can manage for your cattle and at the same time manage for wildlife. You could have both in the same thing, patch burn grazing, rotational grazing, all, you know, uh, rotational burning, all this stuff uh, creates that short grass habitat on a temporary basis, which the shorebirds that like that habitat really enjoy. And of course, that's where the cattle feed and you just kind of move that across the landscape. Uh, and so the whole key to this is say, hey, you know, without you really doing that much different on the landscape, you're creating habitat, you know, with just a little bit of tweaking, uh, uh, you can create more healthy grasslands. And what we have seen in the few ranchers that we have been able to contact, what we've seen sometimes is, is we show them uh, these birds that are coming in during spring migration, say, yeah, and they're wondering what those are. And we tell them, you know, American golden plovers, buff-breasted sandpiper, and hey, guess where they're where they're from? You know, they're way down from South America, and they're going all the way. And and almost everyone thinks, oh my God, this is cool. You know, this is just awesome. You know, so you know, I, in in the past, I think a lot of times ranchers have gotten a bad rap, but they are trying to conserve the land. And if we show them how they could make their working lands work for wildlife and cattle it's a win-win for everybody and it's it, yeah. It, yeah it's coming along awesome i know i will anecdotally um uh, mention i went on some of those uh volunteer efforts too and i remember our group uh encountered a landowner who was like what you guys doing and we were like oh we're looking for all of yeah. these birds and he was so excited and uh was like i know exactly where they hang out follow me like you can come on my yeah, property yeah. let's go <laughs> yeah exactly. so yeah. there's there's uh yeah uh, that's great Okay, a, a couple more questions, and I will remind folks, I know our people on Facebook and YouTube are being a little bit shy. I've got people that are messaging me some questions, but feel free to leave any of your questions in the comment section, and I will be happy to pass those along. Um, that being said, um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to reword this question. Um, so during during f spring migrations versus fall migrations, um, yeah. could you maybe clarify a little bit what the difference in habitat use during those times would be and how burning during those different times would affect them? Well, for the Flint Hills, I think the habitat use is almost exactly the same. I mean, mm. American golden plovers really key in on freshly burned stuff. I mean, uh, Keep in mind that we were trying to survey almost 6 million acres in 2011 and 2018. So we had like over a hundred uh, driving routes that we went on and we quickly started figuring out, just look for the burned areas. That's where they're gonna be. Not everyone, but you know, that, that's the only places they were gonna be. Buff Brits and Sandpipers, because they actually migrate a little bit later uh, coming through in May versus April and mostly April for American golden plovers, uh, they're going to be using that short grass habitat. It's always been almost always stuff that was freshly burned but greened up. So this is what they use all you know, all the all the way up through uh, through the Flint Hills. Same thing for what we've seen so far during the fall, either you know overgrazed pastures or freshly burned uh, pastures is what they've been using. So. Mm it's pretty much pretty much the same habitat during migration uh the buff breasted sandpipers we feel pretty strongly that they are going right up through flint hills during spring migration right up the spine of the flint hills during fall migration uh they spread out a little bit they are seen here at you know in central kansas you know they spread out a little bit so there is a little bit of difference in there because what we do here at Cheyenne Bottoms on the Cheyenne Bottoms Reserve, we purposely have late summer hay to create that short grass habitat. And that's what buff breasted sandpipers use. So there's a little bit difference in the fall because uh, there's not as much burned areas in the fall, you know, typically. So they're finding hay tracks and things like that. Yeah, oh, that's so interesting um, how different they can be even in different times of the year. Oh, yeah. Uh, Okay. 
Um, this question was asked earlier on in the presentation, so I, you probably addressed it in a way that satisfied them, but I will go ahead and um, ask it anyway. So, so clearly uh, differences in grazing pressure impact the habitat quality for these birds. Um, I guess the question is, do you, is there any data regarding the impact of double stocked early stalker cattle versus lower density year round cow calf operations? Yeah. That's a very specific question. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it is. No, and, 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 and I, I know exactly what they're talking about. Okay. So I'm going to go back to for during spring migration with these, these the, the big four I talk about them American Golden Clover, Buff Presses Sandpiper, Keel Deer, and Love Band Sandpiper like short grass habitats. So even even if you're grazing it down to the nubbins, unless there's no invertebrates at all, they like this stuff. You know, they, they like that stuff. Uh, I'm gonna go back here to where I'm at here at Cheyenne Bottoms. We purposely grazed late in the fall to create really short grass habitat here on Cheyenne Bottoms. And that's what shorebirds like. The problem is even here at Cheyenne Bottoms, we don't do that the next spring, we gotta allow that pasture to rest. So. Mm by grazing it down, double stocking, you know, every year, year in, year out, we're gonna lose a lot of forbs and then the invertebrate population is gonna go down and then there's just not gonna be anything for them to feed on. So mm. uh, for, for only a temporary basis, uh, it is, you know, overgrazing or double stocking or whatever type of things that creates that short grass habitat does benefit shorebirds. But on the other flip side, all the other grassland birds, remember, you know, all the other ones that we also want to manage for do not do well under that, that system. Mm -hmm. So that's where, like on a landscape scale, especially the heterogeneity of the landscape yeah. and the different types and models of management is key. That's, well, there you go, Rachel. You should have <laughs> a presentation. You know what's going on. <laughs> No, it's just cool when it all comes together like that with a nice bow on it. It's like there's not one answer because if it was all the same, then it wouldn't work for everything. Well, yeah, because exactly when we're talking about migratory species, we got to talk about their whole life cycle from where they spend their winters or their non-breeding time to where they breed to where they migrate. And every, every location is different and management techniques are different all along that hemisphere. It's a big picture. Yeah. Oh, awesome. I have two more questions for you, and then Great. I will let you go. Uh, the first one is about wind turbines. Do they seem to scare shorebirds away from pasture like they do prairie chickens? Uh, we, I am not aware of any uh, data on that one way or the other yet. I don't think anybody's done that. Uh, hmm. uh, the thought process, <laughs> the thought process is since shorebirds like grassland uh, nesting birds have evolved in a system in which it's a wide open landscape, you know, you know, not only do they like to feed in bed, you know, vegetation half the height of the, of their, the individual bird, but they like to have, be able to see out a long ways and, and just like trees, I know trees, for example, here at Shine Bottoms are a problem. When we take trees out around wetlands, all of a sudden the shorebirds will show up where they've never been before. Mm. It would seem that maybe wind uh, turbines in you know large farm type situations would be a deterrent. Cool. Okay, and uh, finally, well, I've got a comment saying thank you very much for the presentation, but. Uh, Maybe to, to wrap it up nicely, uh, Cassie Stanley wants to know, uh, what is your favorite part of the work you do? Wow. <laughs> you know, you know, I hope my supervisor isn't watching this because, <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't call myself a bird watcher. I don't go chasing birds, right? I really don't go all the way across Kansas finding a rare bird. I'm a biologist, but I get paid. <laughs> I get paid to look at shorebirds. I get paid to do surveys. I mean, they pay me to do this. They pay me to talk to you people about shorebirds. This, the whole thing is great. I mean, I just love it. But because of being migratory birds, I work, uh, I get to work at Shine Bottoms and in the Flint Hills on the ground doing habitat work. 
but I also on, on numerous uh, uh, committees and councils on a hemispheric level. So mm -hmm. I work with people down in South America and all the way up in the Canada. And the fact that we are all working for the same thing is just amazing. I mean, it, it gives you hope that uh, this world can come together if it really needs to. So, man, there isn't one thing. It's, 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 you know, as long as we're talking shorebirds, man, I'm in my world. We're talking about picking up litter on a preserve or something like, or fixing fences, not so fun, but uh, <laughs> shorebirds, I'm in my, I, I just love it. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm not seeing any more comments except for people saying thank you for, oh, for talking with welcome. everyone tonight. Um, so I, I suppose that's it. Um, we should maybe take a moment to appreciate what you have written on your screen. But. Well, I'm hoping uh, in the near future I could actually uh, come to uh, Wichita Audubon meeting in person again. Yeah. I think we're hoping the same thing for ourselves yeah. too. <laughs> and we'd love to see you there. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, look for our updates on our July picnic and uh, we'll see you guys all again sometime in the future. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.